putting Indigenous data and sovereignty into practice, Indigenous Food Knowledges Network, um, and I'll soon be introducing our speakers. Before we get there, though, I would like to, although we're, we're virtual, I do want to acknowledge where the University of Arizona um, and many of us are located in Tucson, Arizona, by reading the uh, official land acknowledgement that was developed by the U of A in partnership with tribal leadership. So we respectfully acknowledge the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the Al-Atham and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education, offerings, partnerships, and community service. And certainly we will hear a lot more about the kinds of partnerships that can be developed with the university and um, Native communities today. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with us, our goal at the Francis McClelland Institute is to use the power of research to build resilient communities where children, youth, and families, especially those from marginalized backgrounds, have the opportunity to thrive. We do this by supporting innovative research, actively partnering with community organizations, sharing research findings with practitioners and the community, and educating the next generation of engaged scholars and leaders. All of the work we do is to honor the legacy of Francis McClelland, who was a, um, a generous philanthropist who believed in the power of research to change lives and who really truly understood, facilitated and celebrated resilience in the lives of children and families. She was particularly interested in advocating for um, individuals um, children, youth, families, and the women and those with disabilities from marginalized or disadvantaged backgrounds. We also want to acknowledge, and I know she's in the audience today, the generous support of another um, alumni at the University of Arizona. Thank you to Pamela Turboville for her support of this speaker series, as well as all of the other things that you do, Pam. Thank you very much for your support. And so without further ado, then, I am very pleased to introduce our speakers, and I'm really excited for this talk. We, you know, we talk a lot about the importance of doing work that has practical implications, and that's truly in partnership with communities, and this is the embodiment of that, and also really focuses on strengths and assets. So we have a co-presentation today. Um, Dr. Lydia Jennings earned her Bachelor of Science from Cal State University Monterey Bay in Environmental Science, Technology, and Policy. She is a postdoctoral fellow in community, environmental, and policy at the University of Arizona's Mallon Enid Zuckerman College of Public Health. Uh, Dr. Jennings' research interests are in soil health, environmental remediation, mining policy, and environmental data ownership by tribal nations. Interesting complementary backgrounds here. Um, Mary Beth Yeager, MSW, is a research analyst at the Native Nations Institute at the University of Arizona, where her work expands a diverse range of Indigenous governance areas. Two of her favorite Indigenous governance areas include Indigenous food and data sovereignty. She leads the Indigenous Foods Knowledge Network and is a co-PI for the comparative study of COVID-19 impacts on individuals' food access, security, and sovereignty in Alaska and the Southwest U.S. One key aspect of the projects is co-producing knowledge with fellow Indigenous collaborators. Overall, she hopes the research will strengthen Native people and nations, relationships with each other, with the land, and with non-human kin. And so with that, I am going to stop sharing and allow them to um, bring up their screen. And I will, if you could hold your questions and answers um, until the end, you can put them in the Q&A portal, or you can raise your hand and we can unmute you, and they will be happy to address questions at the end, and hopefully we can have a great conversation at that point as well. So thank you so much, Dr. Jennings and Mary Beth. Thank you, Melissa. Um, so, Bojo, um, Mary Beth Dejna Kass, Bodo Wadami Koi, also I'm Chicana and of German descent. So, hi, I'm Mary Beth Yeager. I am a citizen of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, um, Chicana and German descent, like I said. Um, thank you to um, the France McClellan Institute for this invite to speak with you today. And I, as um, Melissa already mentioned, that um, Pamela Tuberville is in the audience, so hopefully the speaker series will make you proud. So I'm, it's great to be here today um, presenting with Dr. Jennings um, on our putting Indigenous data sovereignty into practice and the Indigenous Foods Network. And so we're going to do a little bit of introduction 
of both of us. Hello, I'm a citizen. I'm a, I say I'm a tricultural braid. Um, so I'm a citizen of the Pascua Yaqui tribe on my father's side, my mother's side. I'm the Wichola Rikuta people and also Greek. And so um, it's great to be here on both my ancestors, my homelands um, and in the Thanaatham um, homelands. And I was always taught, don't tell me what you know until I know who you are. So just to kind of give a background about myself, um, you know, I, I say that my origin story into my career, my pathway into, and career into science is really around running and running and, and appreciating the land. Um, and so it was really running that brought me to college where I began um, really engaged in environmental sciences and wanting to understand um, what I was seeing out on my runs um, that resulted in both going to a community college um, as well as transferring and earning my bachelor's of science in environmental science, technology and policy in California at Monterey, um, California State University, Monterey Bay. Um, after I finished my bachelor's, I worked for several years um, as an environmental toxicologist for UC Davis. And I got to sample all the major riverways in the state of California. And one of the things that I really noticed in that process was that often communities that look like my own, um, specifically brown, um, brown communities, more marginalized communities were the ones that were often in areas that had the highest environmental contamination. And so, you know, when I would go out and field sample and I would see kids who look like my own cousins, um, I really wanted to be able to use my passion for science in a way that serves indigenous people. Um, and so I came to pursue my PhD um, in studying mining and mining issues because it's such a big issue here in the Southwest. And I was able to um, complete my PhD in uh, 2020. And so I would say just generally um, as a tribal member, uh, my, my environmental work really centers indigenous sovereignty and in our associated knowledge systems. So it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Jennings. So just a little bit of background on me also. Um, I grew up here in um, the Central Oregon area. So Bend, Oregon, that's where I was born and raised, which is the Wasco and Warm Springs. So I grew up in the high desert. As I mentioned before, I'm citizen Potawatomi. We were forcibly removed out of the Great Lakes area into Kansas, then Oklahoma. Um, for whatever reason, my family never left Kansas and there's a high German population in there. So my grandma fell in love with the German. So that's where we get that. And then I also have my abuela here. Um, and part of it is this whole thing with food is that I just still remember my abuela bringing um, food down to, <laughs> uh, uh, not down to, up to Bend um, at the time they were living in LA and she only spoke in Spanish and talking to her in Spanish, her and my abuelo. And, um, and over the years, even after my abuelo died, bringing us Mexican food, um, like tortillas and like the good cheese and and good tortillas also um, before there was any Mexican markets in Bend um, and just watching her cook and the smells of her home visiting her in Boyle Heights um, down in LA. And so feeding people was important to her. Um, my Grammy, um, so on my paternal side was also very important for her for feeding people, even though um, my dad's family didn't have a lot growing up, it was still, you know, there was room for people to eat at the table, which was also true um, with my parents of making sure of feeding people. Um, my, my parents have put on a lot of like feeding people, particularly enchiladas and things like that. And so the importance and the conversations that you could have with people around food and what food holds. And as we were talking earlier about the land acknowledgement, one thing that's important about land acknowledgement is that it's that's a good first step, but then what more can you be doing? And after our presentation, even though it's not native specific, but there is a campus um, pantry at University of Arizona because there are people who are food insecure. Um, I don't like the, <laughs> the term, people who need food. I mean, it's one of those uh, one of those things that I think is incredibly important. And so something to consider um, donating to and, um, and giving time and granted that's a charity thing, but that's a step forward too, of recognizing that. And then also I am now located as some of you may have heard, we were talking, I'm actually, I live on the Duwamish and Coastal Salish lands. And for there, um, advancing the land acknowledgement um, is that I pay, pay real rent to the Duwamish peoples, which is a program that we have here in the Seattle area. So some of you might be wondering if I'm one of those um, pandemic people who moved, 
Um, I'm not. I've actually been at the Native Nations Institute as a research analyst for nine and a half years, and I've always telecommuted. Um, I met my professor, so I have my graduation, which I also refer to as my Slytherin Quidditch robes from my master's in social work from the University of Washington in St. Louis. I met my current boss there. She was a professor, um, Dr. Miriam Jorgensen, who's research director for the Native Nations Institute. And then I just put in, these are all pre-pandemic pictures um, of, of my work with Indigenous Foods Knowledges Network in the Southwest, down here on Thunanam land and up here on Skoltsami land. Uh, the one who is blonde, that's Dr. Noor Johnson. She and I are the co-leads for the Indigenous Foods Knowledges Network. And then these are some of our, like we have Amy Wan here and Shauna Larson and Althea Walker who are on our steering committee. And this is me looking professional. Most of the time I can wear whatever I want to work, um, but I do get, occasionally do dress up. All right, so where, how did the Indigenous Foods Knowledges Network come about? Um, so this research team from the University of Colorado at Boulder and the University of Arizona received four years of funding from 2017 to 2021. And I feel like there's always that pause and we know that March of 2020, so at this two year anniversary of this pandemic, we did do a no cost extension. So we are still being funded by the National Science Foundation um, to develop a research coordination network. And so this is actually the original name of the network down here. Um, but at our inaugural meeting, we asked people what made more sense, like uh, what actually spoke to the people we wanted involved in the research coordination network versus what NSF probably saw as a better name or title. And these are just some of the our partners, obviously, uh, Native Nations Institute and then ALOCA. Um, some of you might be familiar with CLEMAS at U of A and then the United States um, Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network. So we have an IFKIN steering committee, uh, which Dr. Jennings is on. And we have it both from the Southwest and the um, US, uh, US Southwest and uh, the Arctic. And some of you may be wondering, how do those two regions go together? Um, part of the reason they were brought together, and also Dr. Jennings' dog is in there in the shadows, if you can see it. So cute, she's so cute. Uh, is, you know, you're looking at rapid climate change happening in both areas. Um, which is a big thing. Um, also the food, so these extreme environments, water is a huge issue. Uh, there's some similar plants and it's really interesting the different, we'll talk a bit more into the presentation where there are similarities and where there are differences. Another thing we learned um, at, when we were at a meeting in Alaska from the Alaska Toxins Council that a lot of, of the things that go in the air, air pollution that goes up from like, like Arizona, for example, from like the fields and pesticides actually will do a grasshopper effect and be in Alaska. So Alaska will get the effects of, for example, of um, things that are going on in Arizona. And so, and the ones that have asterisks next to them, they're part of the advisory, Indigenous Research Advisory Council for our COVID-19 project, which we'll talk more about too. And just to add on, um, I want to point out as well that we have a balance between having Southwest researchers um, and community practitioners and experts, a balance between the Southwest and the Arctic. So it is really um, a steering committee that fosters collaboration from these two otherwise very disparate um, communities. Um, I think that's a really big strength of this project. Yes, thank you. Um, that is definitely, and that's one of the goals too, is that it's not just scientists or academics, that it is community members. And so this is the research coordination team. Um, so we said Dr. Nord Johnson from University of Colorado. Some of you might know Dr. Stephanie Carroll, Russo Carroll, or Dr. Dan Ferguson, who are both at the University of Arizona. And now you're seeing me via the internet. <laughs> So the Indigenous Food Knowledge Network, we really strive to develop this network of both Indigenous leaders, community experts and practitioners and scholars, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, um, who are thinking about community food, food capacity um, and food security and, and sovereignty in relationship to Indigenous knowledge systems. And so as we kind of mentioned before, we're really striving to build these connections between what people often describe as food deserts, but we've learned through our conversations that a better appropriate term is maybe food apartheid. 
because deserts do have food. Um, and as you can see, one of our um, advisory members, Amy Wan, here with her family collecting saguaro fruit. So we're not a food desert. Desert people have always had foods here. Um, the other part, you know, is recognizing that these two regions, though um, ecologically so different, we have many of the same challenges um, of not having uh, food in close proximity, having soil and water issues, um, having air quality issues, just as um, Mary Beth was mentioning in terms of the grasshopper effect and, and how the decisions that we make in these two very different regions have impacts on one another. So what are the challenges and what are the strengths that we can learn from one another um, in how to address our food security into the future? So, um, we have a set of guiding principles that lead our work. And so first and foremost, our work you know, is to support and promote indigenous sovereignty um, and that this research is led by and with indigenous peoples. And we prioritize community um, and action-oriented frameworks, not empty gestures. Um, and part of a big part of that is being on the land together and experiencing hand on exchange of knowledge. And so you can kind of see here in this photo of when we went up to um, a culture camp up in the Chickaloon village and community members were teaching us how to, how to skin a moose hide. Um, and you can see a variety of different generations in there, but it's through this process of being together on the land that we're really having this exchange of knowledge. Um, we also recognize how language is really critical in knowing how um, we talk about food, you know, in the ceremony around food, um, and that uh, there is so much knowledge and expertise had held in language. Um, we also, within that, in knowing language, also respect our, um, recognize our respect for indigenous knowledge systems. Next slide. Um, continuing on these guiding principles is also that we want to ensure communities have authority over the research projects that affect them. Community members um, and, and cultural practitioners are not, we're not going to be extracting information from them. We really want them to be guiding and telling us if we make a mistake, for example. Um, we also recognize there's a variety of different types of concerns community members might have. So that can include, when we think about food sovereignty, people think about the product, but also recognizing how there is uh, cultural expertise in the seeds and the air, the land, the waters, the plants. The animals, we know we talk about this as our human and non-human kin, and recognizing that there are cultural protocol and respect in those relationships. Another component is recognizing how the data that we generate are powerful tools for supporting indigenous communities and their core values, and that the types of data we publish and work with has to be reflecting the community values. Um, and then lastly, I think kind of coming back to this. Um, a really big strength of this is recognizing the harm that science has traditionally done um, or has historically done um, and really ensuring that we are developing ethical relationships first and foremost before we can conduct research. And so sometimes that's not, that gatherings are just there to sit, we sit together and talk about what we envision. It's hearing sometimes the harm that research has done, letting people express those languages and developing together what can be done. And it takes time. And I think that's one thing that um, is a strength in this, but it also is a little bit counter to what some of the traditional science narrative has been. So with the IFKIN meetings, so that's Indigenous Foods Knowledge Network for short. Um, I kind of smile and be like, oh, back in that day when we, you know, met more in person. But um, so it was started, as I said, we have, so basically the meetings, we had, we've had three meetings plus sent a delegation um, pre-pandemic and we're getting ready to possibly have a um, fourth meeting this fall. And so Nor and I will work with somebody who's a community host. We have to be invited into the community. Um, the person is compensated for their work um, that they do with us. And it we help to um, come up with the agenda together in the sense of the, often the host is like, this is what I want people to see around indigenous foods and what's going on here. And as Lydia was just talking about in our principles, I mean, it's very broad of what we can see. We've seen farming on different scales. It's anything from like hearing stories and also goes with that kind of data and sharing indigenous knowledge is like, what is okay to share? What's not okay. Or for example, 
Thodam Anam Nation meeting, we went to, I'm going to say it wrong, but like the, the sacred spot for them and their mountain, uh, Wai Giek, um, which I know Dr. Jennings can say it much better than I can. Um, and I apologize. And, you know, we could take pictures of the mountain of one part of the mountain, but we could take pictures here. And I mean, it's just understanding in how we, that interactions and what's okay, what's not okay in that sense, but it's also that sharing. And there, um, I honestly could be like the person who has way too many photos from a vacation is like, and then look at this photo and look at this photo with the amount of stories I could tell you from these various meetings. Um, and the traditional of uh, the Festival of Northern Fishing Traditions took place in Finland. And so it was interesting to hear from that point of view of fishing as a recreation or tourism thing, but then how do we talk about them also as our relatives and you know, just the different perspectives and people do have different perspectives. And you know, sometimes we agree, sometimes we disagree, but another great thing we always do together at our meetings and our hosts always find the most wonderful, delicious food to eat. And um, so we'll go a little bit more into some of the things that have come out of the meetings. So, you know, we have this question of how do we prioritize community-centered, action-oriented research with our community experts? And I think a really important one, um, it, first and foremost, is building those relationships. And we find building relationships on the land together is much more effective than being in a boardroom or, you know, looking at PowerPoints together. That's not really an indigenous way of doing things, right? But being in the land and doing activities together, um, sharing humor, sharing meals, and recognizing that in that process, you are, you're really learning and sharing values and you're, you know, developing ecosystem reverence with one another. Um, and so here are a few photos, you know, of us like hiking around and not sleeping because those of us from the Southwest are not used to having, you know, 22 hours of no, of, um, no darkness. So just kind of humor around that, but also having meals together and how much stories come from food and, and um, cultural expertise come from food that are really powerful. And then again, kind of recognizing um, that the knowledge that you're sharing in one another's homeland. And so this is our one of our steering committee's um, members, Amy Wan, um, learning to how to prepare, how to fillet a salmon. Um, and she had mentioned that in that process, you know, sat all day watching and then was invited to learn how to fillet. And how in that process of filleting, really learn kind of the reverence that so many of um, our Arctic community partners have for this sacred, this sacred um, relative, right? That feeds a community and, and, and harnesses it and learning how to do it in a traditional way that really prioritizes this action-oriented relationship building with one another, but also with the land and with our non-human kin. And then kind of on building, to build on that is also to think about, you know, demonstrating this respect for indigenous knowledge systems. And so as one of the points that Mary Beth had mentioned um, was really recognizing um, and knowing the home, the homelands through their care, their traditional stewards and caretakers perspectives. And so this is another photo of our rock star, Amy Wan. Um, and so going to Wakuk, um, which is, um, also known for us locally, Baba Kribi Peak, um, the heart of the Thakwana Atham Nation. And so for Atham, this is the center of the universe. Um, for many others, it's a popular rock climbing area or tribal park. Um, the Border Patrol often passes through there. But so sharing and learning the stories in the land and place and feeling that reverence with community is a really important way of not only learning, but also um, developing that respect for these indigenous knowledge systems. Kind of coming back to our salmon stories, um, also recognizing the need for intergenerational knowledge transfer. We love this photo because you see the hands together caring and, and with love, recognizing the sacrifice the salmon made to feed and sustain their community members. Um, and that is a really important way, I think, of prioritizing indigenous knowledge that um, it's not just one generation, it has to be recognizing the past, present, and future in how we conduct and think about research and food systems and food sovereignty in the, into the future. And then the third is, is also recognizing um, and fostering hands-on knowledge exchange. So sharing activities in community with one another and with the land and our non-human kin, recognizing it's a much more powerful method of knowledge transfer. Um, and so that may mean that 
you know, all of us got, well, it does mean all of us got to help out in the kitchen. All of us got to do some of the hard work. Um, and let me just tell you, scraping loose hide <laughs> off is really hard work. Um, but it is really this activity of being part and making yourselves humble um, to getting teased, to doing the hard work. All of that is an, a really important part, I think, of, of being an uh, Indigenous community member and of showing our respect in these communities. So we've talked a bit about why place-based meetings are important. Um, and you can definitely, I know from my personal experience, like this kind of gap that we've had the last two years of trying to keep making sure that we keep our community safe and having to have this hiatus on our meetings, definitely something I miss um, getting to see everybody in person and on the land. And so, you know, one of the big things is we can learn from each other about what's going on in the land that we've already talked about, or even like historical policies or given current policies that are affecting um, the homelands of the people that we visit. So here, Althea Walker, who was our first host for our inaugural meeting, um, is showing us the canal system. So Gila River, uh, since Simon Memorial had had canals until there was a the dam. And then I think it was 2004, they won, I think it's still the largest federal water settlement to get water back into their canals. And so you're seeing like this hard work of doing and getting the canals, water back into the canals. And then the middle picture is of Alpha. Paulina Faradorf, who is a Sculpt Sami woman. We met at the Festival of uh, fishing, Northern Fishing Traditions. And she was talking about how the Sculpt Sami people had been removed from their land, or they had been, they had kind of migrated into Russia and then removed from Russia back to these lands because they wanted, Russia wanted to mine their, where they were living. And she's showing us this project of where, for them, it's not salmon up there, it's white fish. And how you know they're restoring the river and widening it back out and creating boulders so that fish could spawn and they had done all the scientific it was actually funded as an art project so they were doing video um and one of the our delegation members had asked you know have you prayed for the fish and because that spiritual aspect is very important and it's something she hadn't thought about and i think it was like reawakening these dormant traditions particularly those of us who've been um displaced and whatnot, and just learning. Or it's the same thing back to that salmon picture with the two hands, which I just, I think it's a great picture of like, you know, that adult is still learning how to prepare salmon and it wasn't passed down in the way. Um, it could have been because of brokenness of like, of what the effects of colonization and stuff. And so I think this also gives us a chance being on the lands together of helping reawake dormant um, traditions that people maybe may have or sharing our traditions together and that strength and knowing that we're not alone. And then here, um, the other third picture is our five Alaska natives at the Donna Adam. Uh, they were at a flood farm at uh, the Donna Adam meeting. And it was, it was fantastic to have them, you know, Alaska is very diverse. And I will, Cyrus, who's on the end, was talking about seal oil. So every time we go eat, all five of them are like, do people ever eat meat here? For whatever reason, we just kept eating more vegetarian. And Cyrus would be like, you know, it'd be really good on this seal oil. And then also too, he launched in the conversation of them trying to get seal oil into their elder home and the, the, um, what they were facing to get that, the hurdles and barriers from various government levels, which they have been able since then to su successfully get it in. And then from there, actually talking to someone else, um, through in the Southwest about how to get, um, traditional foods into their elder home and stuff. And so that was, it that's one of the great things about this is getting to create those networks. And so, like I said, and we all know COVID-19 happened. So we pivoted because obviously we weren't gonna be meeting in person anytime soon. And we asked our steering committee, what was something important? What kind of question and going back to the principles that Lydia had talked about is what is important to you all that you would like us to know, um, you know, to get funds because NSF received rap, uh, care funding was often cares Act funding and received rapid grants like many other federal institutions and uh, departments did. And so, you know, they wanted to know how food access was going. And so, and we also wanted to make sure that we had a six person indigenous research advisory council. Um, Dr. Jennings is on it too. And so it was divided in half from the US Southwest and then Alaska. And the reason we defined the Arctic as Alaska was because May, 2020, when we applied, um, like when we were working on it from April 2020 to May 2020, the U.S. was going in a very specific direction with how they were going to handle COVID versus like Arctic 
versus like countries, other countries that have um, Arctic, like Canada or Finland. And so that's why it's Alaska. And so we had this overarching question is how has the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic impacted food access for indigenous individuals in the Arctic and US Southwest? And so we interviewed approximately Dr. Johnson and I and um, Dr. Jennings, 35 people from the Arctic, including Alaska and the US South um, West region. So today we're gonna to talk to you about the US Southwest regions. We, I will, when we're done with this, put into the chat our, we, um, we did a uh, essay for the Arctic report card that NOAA puts out about our Alaska results. And so, and then we're still working on uh, the research coordination team of putting together the two comparison analysis, which we'll be sharing with all our experts. Um, that's one thing we've been doing in this process is we share with the experts who took the subject matter experts who took the time to let us interview them and what they how the data has been interpreted by us as a research team. Does that make sense? What would they change? Um, and so 15, so we'll share this results today with you all, which we've already shared with the um, experts. And then we're hoping to get it into a publication sometime soonish. <laughs> the goal is a spring. Um, and did a little bit more about the results. Just to keep in mind, the interviews were conducted between January and May 2021. If that feels like that, it might have been a couple centuries ago for anybody out there. That was when vaccines were rolling out. Delta was not a thing, really. Hadn't really become a thing. We're going to have like, I don't know. I was super excited about my summer plans at that point. Um, and so as we talk about subject matter experts were members of the IFKIN network and then we, or referred by members and then uh, thank you gifts. So we built these relations up and these relationships and built this trust. So we're researchers that were being trusted by these community members, by these network members to talk to people. And a big thing that also came out of this is that um, the results needed to be given back to the community and to the individuals that we can. And so we know that the Arctic report card has been told that uh, has been used for people for grant writing and things. And we've, you know, asked people, who do you think we should talk to? Um, and so when we get the Southwest, if anybody has any suggestions of where you think maybe Southwest results should go to, um, please let, uh, please let Dr. Jennings and I know during the questions, like I said, we're still working on what that's going to look like, what result is going to come out as. Um, but we do have a plan to talk with the inner tribal, um, yeah, inner tribal Arizona. No, yeah, inner tribal council of Arizona um, this spring too. And so, first, we're going to talk a little bit about the challenges. This is a very brief overview because of time, and um, it's kind of hard to do it in this sense. And it's easier to do it in like more of a storytelling sense, which would take a much more much more time. But a big challenge was accessing store bought foods. Um, and so some of the causes that came from that was COVID-19 restrictions and safety precautions, which was a hard balance of like wanting to keep people safe, but then how do you, you know, get to the store or if you only work when the stores work in the hours that the stores open and so it's not open or transportation. And then you had a lot of non-natives coming on to, not a lot, but there was stories of, I don't know the numbers, we didn't actually say numbers, so I can't, going back to my academic research self, I can't say for sure the numbers, but like, um, you know, non-native grocery shopping on reservations, non-natives grocery shopping, yeah. And there already was this issue before the pandemic started of limited number of reservation grocery stores, particularly for the size of the land base. Um, how to feed families on diminished income, hospitality services, people were furloughed. Um, there's other way, other um, in other industries, that gray economy of artists or the person who has like the food truck or whatnot, there wasn't visitors. And so they weren't making money um, to help out or it was harder to um, ranch or to farm. Accessing food boxes. So this was a common way to try to close that gap of people with food or making sure people had enough food. Um, once again, COVID-19 restrictions and safety precautions, like you weren't, you couldn't take your neighbor with you and, you know, depending on the site, whether or not you could bring a box back for your neighbor. Um, there was a huge distance to get there. There was long wait times. People talked about it being four to six hours, sometimes just waiting for the boxes. Um, what was inside the boxes created challenges. And um, we're starting with the challenges, but I want to 
deeply emphasized that there was a lot of solutions and there was a lot of resilience and a lot of care that also happened to try everybody trying their best to make sure everybody was accessing food. So I do want to underline that because it's, sometimes it's easy to be like, this is what's wrong in the world and this was wrong and this was wrong, but there was a lot of, lot of solutions that we saw also going on. Um, so with the, what was inside the food boxes, one size fits all, not all family members, not all family or households were the same size. Sometimes it was unhealthy foods in the box. Um, also two, if you have high blood pressure, diabetes, um, like prepared food might not be the best for you because of like salt content, or if something was a little bit more sugary, um, donating food, that's not culturally appropriate, which would happen from the outside, like chickpeas, like people are like, I don't know what to do with chickpea. Um, sometimes people didn't know how to cook. Um, and that was something that was a pre-pandemic thing. They just didn't know how to cook. Significant changes in har um, food harvesting because of COVID-19 restrictions and safety precautions. So not being able to be close to people, not being able to um, be with, um, like have family members or non-family members come and help out. So there was that. Um, and then also to this is all pre-pandemic, it still happened, was the drought, the higher temperatures, particularly up in Northern Arizona, stuff around water, um, cause not everybody has, has running water. Um, and also to what was inside of that. And I also really quick to go back what was inside food boxes. Not everybody had the infrastructure like refrigerators or whatnot to hold or freezers to actually keep some of the food and keep it um, from going from spoiling. And then physical and mental health problems related to food and harvesting activities, once again, because of restrictions of COVID restrictions and safety precautions. I mean, it's just like, how do you keep everybody healthy and how do you keep everybody doing okay? But then it makes it very hard to have ceremony because you don't want to get someone who's sick or there was that fear of contracting COVID-19 and people, I mean, it was understandable, like having people die and relatives die, like, what do you do? Um, and so finding... So there's definitely ways of finding around that, but not being able to do that, which is, as I think Lydia and I have said before, or maybe not really directly, but that spiritual component of food and the importance of that goes with food and the cultural um, significance of it too. Well, it's easy to point out the challenges. I think it's also really powerful to look at the solutions that were community driven. And so this is a figure um, I, I built just because I think it's fun to think about those different layers. And so what you see in the external layers of this kind of research onion um, is that we often think about donations that came in from all over the world to support indigenous communities as they recognize how hard, we, how hard hit native communities were. Um, and you also see in the state and federal layer, layer, layers, um, a lot of, you know, using CARE Act's money to buy traditional foods, to, to supply food distribution boxes, or to build infrastructure, such as buying a community freezer. But what also what I think is so powerful is you look at these inner layers of this onion on the tribal community and individual, and that's where a lot of the action was happening. And so it can include things um, of recognizing, you know, the need for vouchers to help food, um, to help communities get members get food um, delivery systems to elders um, or to those with small kids. In one case, uh, one of the tribal nations actually bought a supermarket that was price gouging. Um, and so they bought it and they serve their own community members, which I, I think is so awesome. Um, also just implementing pre-existing plans. But then you see you know, on the community level, not just the tribal member, but each individual community, um, community members stepping up to support their family members or extend, you know, elders, um, both using, bringing them food, water, and traditional medicines. Um, you know, we're really serving elders um, using Zoom as a way to, to, to continue storytelling um, to, and teaching traditional medicines around, and around food. Um, and then also just advocating for community members that couldn't make it to distribution sites. And one of the things that was really brought up, right, is that like, we can act as a tribal member or as a tribal nation or as a community members faster than the state and federal because it's not just our constituents, it's our family members who are being impacted. And then even just recognizing how effective people were on the individual level, making, you know, acting up as community, um, making extra trips to the store, um, using social media to, edu to educate people, but also to get resources for their community members, um, sharing specific climate resilient seeds and growing gardens and teaching people how to do so. So it's a, a really, I think, speaks to the strength of how um, so many tribal nations were able to strive, to, strive together um, to support the future um, of their community members.
I keep forgetting that I'm on mute and usually I'm so good at this. Uh, so some key messages uh, that came out of this is that access to store-bought food has already been an issue pre-pandemic and like the pandemic really exacerbated it and strengthening and investing more in food and um, seed sovereignty and diverse food systems is something that is definitely needs, is important and needs to happen. Also two tribal and mutual aid organizations and nonprofit food sovereignty efforts are already underway. Um, a lot of them kind of kicked into high gear when the pandemic started and like, how do we take care of our members um, and modeling how to grow and gather as Lydia just talked about in some of the, um, I talked about in the solutions and stuff. And, you know, there's hope that being able to grow and connect to food systems with other native and non-native communities during the pandemic and into the future, like to continue those relationships. And so these relationships that are, that were pre-pandemic were good for the, good during the pandemic and hoping to continue to strengthen them as we, I don't even know if you can really call it post-pandemic as we go through whatever phase that we are in now. Um, and then also to, um, you know, pre-pandemic, some people really relied on the tribal government services or community members for food, transportation, water. The water particularly um, had to um, uh, uh, go through essential uh, water in Northern Arizona, as I talked about before. And this resilience even became greater during the pandemic, particularly for people who came down with COVID-19. Um, and then the overall response was to reach out to help relatives and community members and being willing to accept help too. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jennings, um, cause, uh, cause I think she will have to leave sooner than later from the presentation. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think that the other part that I was planning on speaking about was just talking about our next steps. Is it okay if I hop ahead to that? Um, and so really thinking about our future steps, which Mary Beth has kind of already began to cover a bit is that um, we, one of the things that I, I think it's a great honor to be here, part of the Tuber World series is, is recognizing how we're making our, the research that we're doing accessible to community. And that is something that has been really important in terms of sharing with community members and our subject matter experts and our participants and if can network about how these results how, how much do they feel appropriate? Are there things that we should be phrasing differently? Are we interpreting the data accurately? Um, and you know that is an important part of having this advisory committee, but then also gaining um, support and information from community members about how to, where's the best places to share this information. Um, and that's part of this broader, broader public education that I think is so important. So not only making sure that we're generating academic articles, which is important for us as researchers, but also to make sure that, that we are um, sharing this information with tribal members and tribal leadership. Um, that's why we're looking at working with the Tribal Council of Arizona, but also with local media um, to ensure that this information is going to be spread to, to the communities that need it most and how it can help inform future policy future preparation as many communities are thinking about how COVID has demonstrated strengths and weaknesses um, in food security that might have seriously implications for climate change um, variability. And so that is some of the important work that we are working on right now, as well as thinking about what is the future directions that we want this project and the IFKID network in general to focus on that is guided by the recognized um, gaps and needs of our community uh, leadership. So I, I really feel like it's a, a place of us as researchers being guided by community to do effective um, data dissemination and dis effective questions um, that really serve our communities. And with that, oops, I think next slide, Mary Beth. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so with that, um, you know, I, I think, um, we're just really appreciative to be here with you all. I'm sorry that I actually have to go. I guess we got talking on stories too long, um, but you know, really wanting to be so thankful to the many subject matter experts that we have, the communities, our non-human kin, and the lands that share their knowledge and nurture us. Um, and we continue to strive to give that knowledge back um, and you know use this knowledge in a way that benefits the many communities we engage with. Um, and so there's our web website. Um, and if you want to join on to our listserv 
or contact Mary Beth, who really, Mary Beth and Noor really kind of steer the ship and um, have brought me on more recently. I can stay for a few questions and then uh, I probably have to hop off and you can continue having those conversations with Mary Beth as well. Thank you so much to both of you. This was really inspirational work in a lot of ways um, to demonstrate what, what true collaboration means. Um, really interesting and important work. Questions, anyone? And again, you can put the questions in the Q&A portal or you're welcome to raise your hand and we can let you talk. Okay, so I have a hand to go up. Or... I saw a hand to go up. Thank you for providing that report. One thing I want to point about the Arctic report card that Mary Beth um, attached in here is that it's the first time that um, indigenous food knowledges and traditional ecological knowledge have been included in the Arctic report card. That's huge. Um, and so we're really proud of that work and of amplifying um, the many community experts who have shared this knowledge with us. I'm just putting in the links that I mentioned during the talk real quick so that I don't forget to. That's helpful. Thank you. It looks like Desiree Collins has a question. Ah, does she? Thank you. Okay. Desiree, we can. Um, sure. Thank, thank you. Um, so a lot of, it seems like a lot of your work is kind of in the ac uh, academia arena. Um, what would you say would be scalable steps for um, nonprofits or community organizations to kind of replicate that, the intentionality that you've brought to working with indigenous communities? Uh, I think a big part of it is just that relational building. It's that just getting to know who's there. And that, I mean, these conversations take a really long time. And one thing we talk about, and I think it fits into like, I think you could say outside of the academic world is funding cycles often don't fit the amount of time you need to build relationships because you need to build that trust because a lot of damage has been done and continues to get be done by researchers or nonprofits um, in Indian country. And so that's, a, and that's a hard thing is sort of like, how do you kind of, you know, building that trust, um, sitting around the table, um, picking, uh, we had some, a joke, a, a different conference I was at, like, you know, you need to like chop the wood, you need to drink the tea, hold the baby kind of thing. And so it just takes a lot, it takes a while. Um, and so it's not something that comes overnight. And as you build the trust, um, people are more willing to talk about um, like what they might need as a community versus what you might've thought they needed. And I think that was a big thing we see, especially with what was given um, when like food that wasn't culturally appropriate, that's not uncommon in aid that's given um, that is not actually helpful. Perfect, thank you. I don't know, I was like, Dr. Jennings, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think the part of relationship building and of, of is so, so critical and I, I just don't know how to replace that. And as a student, I learned a lot from being part of this network and then now kind of being part of the steering committee. And it makes me re reflect on a lot of how I was trained. So I think that part of also training in ethical relationships is so important. Um, but I think the other part is, is recognizing how, um, how much like research and, and also nonprofits have really extracted from communities. And so there is a, a process of like lack of trust and it's like showing up and being there, even when like you can't, you're not gonna get something from it, right? Um, but just like being in, 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 in position at all times and offering, you know, um, an example would be someone was doing a fundraiser for a grandkid to travel um, and being able to support that, you, you know, that's part of like building an extended family and building an extended relationship that I think is really important. Um, but often that's something that we're taught in education or in many people's communities aren't taught. Um, and so I think that yeah, it's just really central. 
Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. We have a question in the Q&A. Um, Kara asks, have you all collaborated with Tribal Extension already, or are there plans to work with Tribal Extension to share your results? She goes on, I'm only familiar with Tribal Extension in Arizona, but know that food sovereignty is a major area of interest in their program. I don't know, Mary Beth, do you? Yeah, I do. Um, so uh, Dr. Michael Johnson, who is on our steering committee has just been my understanding, he's, he's been hired recently with um, Tribal Extension. And so that's one way to reach out to it. Um, and I think Dr. Carlotta Chief has some work with the Tribal Extension too in her, um, uh, I'm gonna blank on the name of her program and FUSIS. I think that might be right. Um, and with that, and so it's just kind of building those relationships around campus. And I, because Dr. Coletta, uh, Dr. Coletta Chief has come to one of the events that we've had. We had something, the Tonanum event we had on the land, and we also had a thing at the University of um, Arizona. And to, to talk, and it was a lot about talking about like research and how can, you know, university researchers do a better job and be more responsive and got asked a lot of hard questions. Um, and everybody just sort of um, put into it uh, or kind of like took it, I guess not, I don't know if took it's the right way to say it, but like, you know, listened and like tried to respond in the best way possible. And then also to um, uh, the Center for Regional Foods, um, which Dr. Megan Carney and Dr. Laura, um, Laurel um, Belante are a director and um, assistant director uh, respectively. Uh, they also came to like that meeting, for example. Um, and so that was, uh, right, Dr. Jennings has to go, but thanks, thank you so much for your work. I appreciate it. Um, you know, and working with them too and having conversations and uh, like, for example, in their regional newsletter that they put out that we have like the Arctic report cards in there. And so for people to, or to report card to say, that's kind of a long winded answer to your question about tribal extension, but that is something that definitely, hopefully working with Dr. Johnson more, Dr. Michael Johnson, since we have two Dr. Johnsons on our, on our project. Any other questions? I will say this is a minor thing, but just thinking about the intentionality of language, it never, I never really thought about we shouldn't be using the term food desert and kind of what that what that means and what that signifies. And if that's um, important to sort of again get someone else's perspective on that, what that means. Yeah, I was somebody who had used it too. And I actually had heard it in a podcast first and then like being, you know, Gila River and Dona Atham and it was, and also where I grew up, I'm like, yeah, there's, this is a whole grocery store medicine pharmacy out here that we don't think about. And one thing that I really liked that we talked about when our principles and we were coming up with our guiding principles was, you know, if my grandma can't understand what we're talking about, like, then do we really understand? And I, I know that's been said in other ways. And I think that goes outside of academia too. Um, it's very easy to start to talk in certain language or whatever the buzzwords are or in abbreviations. Um, but how could you explain it to your grandparents? Is something to keep in mind. Yeah, I think that's a great rule of thumb for all, all of us in the research world to keep in mind, you know, what's the, what's the meaning of what we're doing and how do we communicate that? Yeah. Other questions, comments, thoughts? Let's give people a little time, time to think. Well, thank, thank you so much. I really yeah. appreciated you coming to share this work. Um, and we really, you know, keep keep in touch with us, please. We'd love to, to you know, know what you're doing. Um, when you do get to sort of sharing with a wider audience, we would love to, to help share with us. I think, um, again, just a, a, an example of, of really doing impactful community partner, um, truly community partner uh, work. And I have to say, it also sounds really inspirational bringing together members of these different tribal communities to, to learn about each other too. I think that's, um, it seems like that was another really interesting sort of level. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been really fun. Um, when we were at the culture camp, uh, we had kind of a uh, fry bread bake-off 
<laughs> like there are several of the different, different tribes from the Southwest. And so it was like trying to see who could make the best fry bread for the cultural camp um, for the kids and for the adults and stuff and um, in a good way too. So um, yeah, thanks for everybody for participating. Um, I appreciate it. So yeah, please reach out if you have questions or whatnot, but um, I was going to say something about the, uh, also with the partnership um, with the or the way going back to language. So with the Arctic report card, there's a lot of um, a lot of things that are happening that aren't great in the Arctic, obviously with the climate change and stuff, but mm -hmm. also too about how um, Corey Erickson, who's on our advisory committee and now steering committee, um, he talked about, you have to remember that people live there and that, you know, we, when you talk about everything in doom and gloom, that's why I try to make a point with the challenges. Like it's not all doom and gloom. Yes, there are definitely challenges. Don't be Pollyanna. I, myself don't be Pollyanna about it, but like that, um, that that's where people live. You're talking about where people live and your mm -hmm. their relatives, um, human and non-human. So just another way of thinking about like, how do you report things out? And I know in social work, this is a, we call it strength-based and like making mm -hmm. sure to focus on that versus deficits and stuff. So. No, absolutely. Okay. Any other? So again, I'll say thank you again. Thanks. Um, <laughs> So thank you for presenting and thank you all for attending and we hope to see you at future events. Okay. Thanks. Have a great Friday, y'all. <laughs>